So um, usually with the first book, I was I was hearing that you re- you read it you write it from the heart instead of the mind because this is like a passion project is your first book. Um, mm-hmm. Is there that's anything, accurate? Yeah. Is there anything in this book that so many years later you're like oh, I would have just tweaked or oh, well, this could have been good. Red Rising was my seventh book uh, that I wrote. Six before that I wrote uh, did what not get published. About? A lot of things. Science. There was science fiction. There was historical fiction. There was fantasy. There was a thriller. Uh, I wrote a bunch of different things. And I had to, what do I say? How do I say it? I feel as though uh, you have to exercise the mimicry um, because what all you're doing is you're a fan, you have taste, and then you start realizing that you have your own voice. So, you know, Red Rising, while it was my first published book, um, was at that strange intersection of discovering my voice and also uh, it being a heart passion project because I remember I didn't even outline it. I just sat down and started writing. That's called pantsing. Um, I'm a pantser. Yeah, um, so I fully. only just discovered this term today because yeah. I'm not a writer, I'm a reader and I'm oh, a talker. Get- yeah, you yeah, it gives pant- everyone. A- Go ahead. Well, pantsing, from what I thought it was, you deck, you deck someone, you pull the pants down. We well, can do that too. It's oh. not you know mutual exclusive term. I you know I've I've done that in my day. Yeah. Mm. You pants them and you cherry tree them. What's the cherry tree part? Uh you have someone kneeling behind them and then they get pushed over. That would happen to me. I was the new kid at school a lot, so I. Got oh, I was gonna. Tree. I thought you yeah. were doing it to other people. Oh no no I wasn't a bully. I was always new. Oh, that's tough. Yeah, yeah. Did that shape yeah. your personality completely? Yeah, it taught me to have a lower center of gravity, so you can't get pushed over. Yeah. Well, and, you haven't uh, explained cherry tree. David, General David Petraeus, uh, who helmed the efforts in Iraq for a long time, had something that he told uh, incoming officers, and he says, be polite and courteous, but always have a plan to kill everyone you meet. So my plan in high school was to, you know, uh, have a plan to not get cherry treed wherever I went. So whenever someone came up to me, I'd always be suspicious that I was about to get pants or cherry treed. We're in the book, right? How, <laughs> how do we fare? Was that? Well, you said that you've practiced having a lower center of gravity. Uh, you got oh, yeah. you got bullied a lot. You were in survival mode. Yeah. Um, Lord of the Flies. Uh, it's kill or be killed was a mentality through this a lot. How would you realistically fare in that second challenge? Oh, the pa- the passage? Yeah. Is that the second challenge? Well, uh, the, in the, pa- the first one is you got to kill the person in the room. Oh, that first passage. So what's the second pass? What's the second challenge in your mind? The, the second challenge is the full on castle. Um, oh no, I, I think I'd I think uh, I think I'd excel in that because I'd be excited to finally be in that situation. What would you do? The, would you scout? Would you hunt together? Would you? I'd probably be like Severo. I would uh, peace out, let the house because it's it's always when they're deciding the the regime that people get killed. So if you look at any purge throughout history, whenever the government is shifting, that's when people die. Um, yes. It's, you know, it's it's basically consolidation of power means a lot of people get you know killed in the middle of the night. Um, and so you if have to I was be on Severo, the right side. Yeah. Yes. If I was Severo, or you have to be on the right side, or you are you get yourself out of the situation and then, then then assess. So I'd be like, with all these power hungry people who are like you know way more powerfully built than I am and better bred and trained, I'd get the hell out and then I'd like you know peep through the window and see when like I could come and back in and add value. Okay. That's an idea. That's, that's the best be, survival tactic. You wouldn't be you. You would be a gold. So what does gold pierce look like? I don't know. I don't know. It depends. But the, there's a problem is a lot of it doesn't depend on you because they're young in the book. So they're more so a product of their parents and their lineage. And so it would be decided based unfairly on my lineage and my you know personal pedigree. So then that's one of the fundamental unfairnesses of the book uh, and, in, and in our society. You're not a product of your efforts. You're not a product of what you choose to live for. You're very much shaped and angled like a spear by your parents and then thrust into the, what do they call that in Rome? They call it in Rome the cursus honorum. Cursus honorum is the stages that one has to ascend within political appointments in order to get the next, uh, the next appointment. Mm. And so the goal there was always to be a consul. Not to be a consul, actually. The consul was the guy basically, there are two of them, they ran Rome, they had like a year long, often a year long or sometimes two year long reign. They ran Rome, but after they were consuls, they got appointed to be a military governor somewhere and that's what everyone wanted. So the consul, the top position was not even the end of the cursus honorum. You wanted to go off, uh, be the magistrate of Macedonia or Spain or Illyria, and then basically extract wealth, hopefully conquer a few territories, sell 
well, wealth in their time, particularly if Rome was slaves, like Caesar, when he took Gaul, he took back 2 million people into slavery in Rome. And 2 million people made him a trillionaire in his day and time. So these people, these, these figures, and what I love in the gold world is these figures had disproportionate power, a uh, power so disproportionate to our even understanding of it. They had personal armies. So it'd be like wow. if, you know, it'd be like if Elon Musk, we think of him as rich, you know, compared to Caesar coming back with 2 million slaves, he's not rich because Caesar had an army about 100,000 100, people, 150,000 people. Imagine like an Elon Musk with 150,000 or proportionately, so like a million man army. Well, like, they how, call how Twitter blue scarier. subscribers. <laughs> Yeah, tw <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. But instead of, you know, getting paid by his uh, subscribers 84 bucks or whatever it is a year, all those guys will die and kill for Caesar. Wow. You know, and so that's, that's why I like playing with history and then putting that in Red Rising. So all these people are competing to be able to be a guy or a gal who can have a million-man army and really have influence. So all these people, when they finally at the curse, end of the curse of Sonorum, would come back home. Uh, with tons of wealth, then they would retire or try to affect Roman politics. I'm rambling. How long could you talk question. about this for realistically? What's that? How long could you talk about this and not come up for air? Oh, I could filibuster all day, literally. Wow. I, it's, it's a huge passion. Like I, I think often uh, science fiction or fantasy books uh, will wear the clothing of ancient Rome or Greece, but they're not actually like the authors are seldom like love it. Like I just, I just love yeah. the history of the time period. It's really fascinating to me. It's particularly interesting because we live in a world where uh, people are so separate from their power. They can sit behind a desk in Washington or wherever and send other people to die. Mm -hmm. um, but in Rome and in Greece, you had to go put yourself in the front lines. And I feel as though that bred a very different type of creature yeah. and a very different type of exploration of themes than we have. We can't say a president is brave. We can't say that a senator... Uh, showed honor, you know, not in the same way. The metal wasn't tested. That's why the Institute, the Institute is meant to strip away all the things that separate you from the themes that I want to play with. What would you be like when you had to stare your decisions in the face and create out of nothing civilization? Because mm -hmm. they try, you know, in, in, in Red Rising, the Institute is basically, it's meant to mimic the three, the three stages of society, which are any society, which is savagery, uh, ascendance and then decadence and so these people are going through you know like a little sim city of what uh, uh, like you ever play civilization the game or Rome total war or any of these 4x games I loved those growing up and um, the real-time strategy games but also when you'd be on you know a battle map like a, a map and have to have your economy and stuff they're basically going through the progressions of civilization and so that's the lesson that's t taught to these golds. And so like when I discovered this kind of like concept for Red Rising, I was so excited to finally get to talk about all these things, but with spaceships, with gravity yeah. boots, with all these far, you know, ridiculous ideas. I don't want to get into spoiler te territory. Mm. What's your favorite from the first book, favorite thing that you crafted, that you created? What's my favorite thing I crafted? So there, uh, you were talking about gravity boots. You were talking about the, this, like the different weaponry, the different... I would say, yeah, I would say carvers. Um, because when I started thinking about uh, technology, and a lot of times in science fiction, like Star Wars decided to be World War II in space. And that's a way that the technology doesn't run away from the character interactions. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it was attaching the technology to the overall theme of the golds, which is humanism. How can we make an individual human uh, be able to project their power in a physical and metaphorical way? And so they, they do it with their arm, suits of armor and their spaceships, and they're all, it's all about projecting internal power. And so they don't have like AI or robots involved because that goes against their kind of thematic, like their religion really, which is the exalting the human, right? And so I would say that it would be carvers because uh, the ability to craft griffins and dragons and uh, designer monsters and put wings on people, it really kind of made this world, I thought, unique because you see these people that have unlimited technology diving into fantasy and being like, we want to keep fantasy alive. Yeah. So some of these golds are so rich, they have an entire continent that's just a game preserve. you know. And in many ways, the evil tyrants are pr way better with nature and with preserving uh, wildlife than you know others would be. So like they're very fascist and evil, yet they some of them would like have a whole game per uh, like a preserve for natural wildlife and you know bring back uh, uh, species that had been extinct. 
So I'd say carvers are really fun to play with.